The 5th century is packed with numerous theological controversies, which left the church in schisms that persist to this very day. Despite being a tragic century in this sense, it included numerous figures who upheld the Orthodox faith, as received from the Apostles through the Fathers of the 4th century to those of the 5th century. With the dawn of the 5th century, a new Patriarch named Nestorius was elevated to the Patriarchal throne of Constantinople after John Chrysostom had died in exile. Like Chrysostom, Nestorius was a committed disciple of the school of Antioch and its leader, Theodore of Mopsuestia. In contrast to the school of Alexandria, the school of Antioch emphasized the distinction between the divinity and the humanity in the person of Jesus Christ. The school of Alexandria, however, emphasized the unity of Christ's being and did not focus on the distinction between humanity and divinity. Nestorius used the rational of his school to form a new opinion where he refused to call Mary the mother of God or Theotokos and preferred to call her Christotokos, mother of Christ, or Anthropotokos, mother of the man. This was based on the proposition that Mary gave birth to an ordinary man who later became conjugated with the Logos or the Word of God. This claim was based on the school of Antioch's teachings. The claim that Mary was the mother of Christ or man was met with resistance from the people of Constantinople. Cyril of Alexandria, who was the nephew and successor of Theophilus, the one who had excommunicated John Chrysostom, the predecessor of Nestorius, was highly displeased with such notions and began exchanging letters with Nestorius. When the exchange of letters failed to end the controversy, Emperor Theodosius II convened a council of 200 bishops in Ephesus in 431 AD. The council took place during the reign of Pope Celestine of Rome and his deacon Leo, who were not present at the council, but rather sent delegates on their behalf. Leo would later become the Pope of Rome during the time of the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD. Alexandria's representatives were Cyril and his deacon Dioscoros. From Constantinople, Nestorius was present with his bishops. His supporters from Antioch, headed by John of Antioch, arrived late to the council so that the council began its sessions prior to their arrival. The Council of Ephesus consisted of seven sessions, which ran from June 22nd until July 31st. The council condemned the heresy of Nestorius and upheld the orthodoxy of the title Theotokos used by Cyril of Alexandria. Nestorius was exiled, deposed from his office, and replaced with Flavian of Constantinople. Cyril's theology was predicated upon the unity of Christ. In Cyril's conception, Jesus Christ was one incarnate nature, meaning one subject and one hypostasis after the Incarnation. Cyril used the terms nature and hypostasis interchangeably, as did the Alexandrians and some Antiochians. Hypostasis denotes a concrete reality that may be simple or composite. In the case of Christ, the one hypostasis encompassed the divinity and humanity in their fullness, yet Christ remained one subject and one hypostasis. To Cyril, 
Christ's oneness does not compromise the distinction of the divinity and humanity from which the one Christ is composed, though this distinction is in contemplation alone or in one's thoughts alone. This language, which Cyril used, together with the fact that the council began prior to the arrival of the Antiochian party, caused the Church of Antioch to impeach communion with the Church of Alexandria. When a schism was clearly emerging, Cyril of Alexandria approached John of Antioch to reunite and composed a formula of reunion which ended the schism between the two churches. The formula of reunion allowed the Antiochians to use the two-nature language instead of the one-nature language initially used by Cyril and the Alexandrians, though only if it is accompanied by sufficient qualifications that preserve the unity. As John McGugan puts it, Cyril had no intention of using such language, i.e. the two-nature or the diphysite language himself. And in the letter to Eulogius and that the Christ is one, he says explicitly that he regarded their whole way of thinking and arguing as obscure. He admitted that diphysite terms could be orthodox on two grounds. The first was that the natures in question mean natural properties, not independent subject entities, and therefore one was talking about states or conditions and not persons. The second was that their continuing coexistence should be radically qualified by sufficient indications that these two realities had actually been united, made one, were inseparable in mutual communion, or only notinally separable, like body and soul, and not practically divisible. Cyril seems to have reassured them, i.e. the Cyrillian party, his own party, on the basis that it was a concession to be understood in terms of his previous teaching, not as an amendment of it. As such, it became clear that the decrees of the Council and the formula of reunion were to be always paired together to formulate the Christology of the Church. The tension between the one and two nature or thesis formulations continued to persist, especially with extremists at both ends of the spectrum. An example of this is Eutyches, a Constantinopolitan Archimenedrite, who had minimal theological training and who planted the seeds of a church schism that would persist to this very day. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to be notified of all our future content. You can also follow our official Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages. Please support this mission on Patreon. Here's also a link to the Arabic YouTube channel. Please also contact us through our official web pages if you have any questions, comments, or concerns on the content of the videos. Thank you.